good afternoon and i welcome you all back uh, for the next session that is uh, 34th dr sg shrikantaya memorial lecture award i am very honored and privileged to be coordinating this uh, session on this prestigious award so i would like to invite uh, dr aula lakshmaya secretary nsi onto the stage i invite dr janaki shrinath ec member nsi onto the stage i invite dr kamala krishna swami past president nsi onto the stage i invite dr r hemalata director icmr nin onto the stage so i request dr aula lakshmaya secretary nsi to uh, talk about the 34th sg shrikantaya memorial lecture award good afternoon everyone so i am very much privileged to read about uh, shrikantaya memorial uh, award so dr shrikantaya was born in 1926 in an illustrious family in mysore after his brilliant undergraduate career in mysore medical college he joined the national institute of nutrition then known as the nutrition research laboratories nrl kunur in 1951 so he served the institute with rare distinction and dedication for more than 3 decades till his voluntary retirement in 1980 so from 1974 to 1980 he was the director of the nin and he continued to be active in research and teaching was associated with the university of mysore and served as temporary advisor for who so dr sikandeya was an internationally renowned nutrition scientist with outstanding contributions in clinical nutrition he was versatile knowledgeable and well informed not only in clinical nutrition but uh, he also in nutritional biochemistry and public health nutrition so his studies on the role of ferritin in the pathogenesis of nutritional edema have attracted considerable attention in the community in the uh, scientific uh, fraternity and his pioneering research contributions on protein energy malnutrition vitamin a deficiency nutritional anemias pellagra fluorosis have earned the academic recognition he led the studies on the prevention and control of vitamin a deficiency in the country and was the man behind the national vitamin a prophylaxis program now it is continuing as a massive dose of vitamin a program he was a member of the editorial board of the indian journal of medical research dr srikantiya has several publications to his credit including a book chapters and he supported and strengthened the nutrition foundation of india and he played a leading role in the formulation and implementation of many of its research projects a man of simple habits and sterling qualities upright sincere devoted to scientific uh, pursuits and uh, loyal to the committed cause srikantya was a friend and philosopher and guide to many of our, our colleagues so now nsa is proud to announce that the 33rd dr srikantya memorial lecture will be delivered by dr r hemalata director icmr national institute of nutrition and also president of nsi so she is delivering on topic uh, is india eating right thank you thank you thank you very much sir uh, now i uh, request dr janaki shrinath uh, to talk about the recipient of the award warm greetings to all the stalwarts of nutrition i think i am been really blessed this month and this day thank you uh, dear friends and students and delegates it's my honor and pleasant duty to uh, present dr hemalata madam's work today she has been the worthy recipient of dr srikantaya memorial oration dr hemalata ma'am began her journey with a degree in medicine followed by an md from gandhi medical college hyderabad dr ntr university of health sciences she has more than 3 decades of uh, jo uh, scientific journey at nin which led to her appointment as director nin in 2017 we i personally remember madam as a young lady who has a 
very stiff bob cut and walking in the library very silently and we used to think okay madam is from microbiology department so we didn't have much interaction at that time as a student we never knew later now it's a full circle and nutrition is microbiota and microbiota is nutrition so she is way ahead in that way uh, dr himlata madam's research interests encompass maternal child health and nutrition she has authored more than 200 peer reviewed scientific papers book chapters and regulatory reports her research efforts have generated vital information on the impact of inflammation and lower reprodu reproductive tract infections on fetal growth she has worked extensively on nutritional status and immunity in women and children and carried out basic studies to support her clinical findings and demonstrated the role of nutrition and gut bacteria on endotoxemia inflammation insulin resistance and lipid profile to ensure good nutrition and health of the woman in preparation of pregnancy she conceptualized a preconception kit that addresses risks like undernutrition anemia other health issues to improve birth outcomes and health of the mother and the baby madam has led the seminal work on the most important tool we dietitians and nutritionists always carry and without that we can't do our work the rda book the latest rda book and she in her tenure it was the first time the rda book the nutrient recommendations included estimated average requirements and also the tolerable upper limits of nutrients which now is the yardstick and baseline for fortification strategies food labeling supplementation programs are based on these recommendations she also spearheaded the most simple most easy the most indian my plate for the day which provides food based guidelines to prevent undernutrition and ncds as part of the poshan abhiyan initiative she has developed 14 e learning modules aimed at empowering adolescents young adults and anganwadi teachers the report what india eats gives overview of regional dietary pattern of indian population and energy and protein sources from different food groups which i think madam will be presenting now dr himlata madam is currently the president of nutrition society of india and executive council member of the federation of asian nutrition societies she is also an expert member of various task force committees of the ministries such as national technical board on nutrition and national council of nutrition of niti aayog steering committee member of the south asian policy leadership for nutrition and growth to name a few she has always been a extremely good student she has been honored with various awards including the young scientist award of nsi ponduri venkatramana rao gold medal for md 7th rajamal p devdas memorial oration award dr kamlapuri sabarwal memorial award change maker award and professor m vishwanathan gold medal oration award and re the recent dr anandi goyal best nutritionist award from the international society for medical food and nutrition she is a fellow of the national academy of medical sciences international union of nutrition sciences and telangana academy of sciences the institute received two awards under her leadership excellence in nutrition science and technology from poshan outlook and poshak anaj award from indian council of agriculture research indian institute of Medi uh, military research welcome ma'am thank you for <clears throat> giving me this opportunity to felicitate dr hemalata i think many of us or many of you also may not know that i had known dr hemalata even before she joined this institute she came for a project work in my department in the food and drug toxicology division and uh, i saw she was very good with uh, her medical knowledge and she was keenly interested in pediatrics 
So I felt sad that she's coming for a project which is, which is entirely different from what she wants to do. And so I advised her, it would be good for you to apply for a post in the pediatric departments of NIN, which is very soon going to be advertised. And I, 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 of course, I cannot say I assured you of the job, but I said, I'm sure you will get selected. Well, I don't know what she thought about it, but she did apply for that post, and she got selected into the pediatric nutrition department under Dr. Bhaskar. I, I think while speaking about her, I came to realize that she's not only uh, good in the medical subject, but she also has a skill-based approach to research as well, which is very rare in medical students. So I think my, uh, my Dr. Bhaskaram realized that, and she immediately took her into this job. I know that uh, she, her post was going to be, I mean, uh, uh, quite hard, as Dr. Bhaskaram is a taskmaster, and she's very strict with all her colleagues. And she survived that and came up and did a lot more research subsequently, which just now you heard from Dr. Janaki. I saw, I saw her working <clears throat> day and night, very hard work, and I felt that she would come up in research very fast. I think, I can't think, if you have listened to her speech, uh, the inaugural speech in the morning, I can't think that anyone will think somebody deserves this award more than her. And despite several other problems, she has become very successful persons through her talents, skills, knowledge, and dedication and perseverance. She is a team builder, and all her colleagues were very happy with her. She had a big group even, because, even before she had become the director. And I don't think the selection committee at ICMR hesitated to give her the post. I once again congratulate you, Hebelata. Please do remember, you do have several more, uh, several peaks to scale, and I'm sure many more awards to win. Thank you. Now I request uh, Dr. Kamala Krishna Swam, ma'am, to uh, present the oration award to our director, Dr. Hemalata, madam. Congratulations, ma'am, for uh, the oration award. And now I request, madam, to deliver the oration lecture. Hearing so many kind words, I'm too overwhelmed. I forgot everything, whatever I have to speak. Madam has been too, too kind to me. And actually, uh, Dr. Janaki put it very, very beautifully. Even I didn't know that it can be expressed so beautifully, but she did such a good job. Thank you, Janaki. Thank you so much. Even I didn't know that it can be put that way. And madam, for all your love and affection, I always feel you're my mother. Right from day one, you have been nurturing, guiding, and uh, always I felt a motherly love from you. Thank you, madam. Thank you so much. And yes, Dr. Bhaskaram was a strict taskmaster, but just because of that, whatever I am today is because of that. So thank you. I thank Dr. Bhaskaram also, late Dr. Bhaskaram. Uh, she taught me immunology. I started working in a lab. I mean, uh, very few medical people would like to go into a lab, but then I dared and I learned. And even today, I, I remember how we have to, how we can isolate uh, white blood cells from whole blood. So this is the work I did. I went to hospitals. I collected samples from tuberculosis patients, protein energy malnourished children. I can even uh, go to the jugular vein and collect blood sample from tiny children, give them injections and all. So I really become tough 
and uh, very skillful because of my madam, Dr. Baskaram. And behind that, Dr. Kamala Krishna Swami, and yes, Dr. Vinodini madam, also, she loved me like anything. And she also, I mean, guided me a lot. And now she's not with us because she's sick. So I'm really very happy and I mean, uh, 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 pleased to receive this award. It's very, very humbling. Uh, Dr. Srikandaya exemplified humility. He did remarkable contributions in the field of nutrition, but not many people know about it. I mean, he, very silently he worked. That's what I heard from Dr. Mohan Ram, our former director. He even ra now lovingly remembers him and he says, he did a lot of work, but then he never came outside for publicity. He never wanted that. So he exemplified humility, but a very a uh, strong, grounded scientist that he was. So I feel very proud and happy, and it is also a humbling experience to receive an award on the name of none other than Dr. Sri Kandaya. Thank you so much, and thank you for the, I'll thank all the, the committee members for thinking that I deserve this. Thank you, madam. Actually, uh, in his keynote address, Dr. Mohan made my job uh, very easy, because uh, my thinking is almost in line with whatever he said. Yes. Whatever we advise to a diabetic patient, it is also true for a normal healthy individual. When I was making a presentation to a um, group long back, it was again another oration award, I think. They asked me, what should be the diet for healthy individuals then? I said, whatever we advise for diabetics is actually good for leading a normal healthy life. So here I go. Um, is India eating right? I mean, it looks very... How do I? Yeah, this is one. So before going to what India is eating, let us know what standards we have set for Indians to eat and whether they are in line with our recommendations. So very quickly I'll go through this because there are concerns raised by various communities regarding the recommendations that we make. Some are decreased, some are increased, but it happens actually uh, throughout, I mean, right in 1944, the first version of RDA came from NIN under Indian Council of Medical Research. Right from then, this is the fourth version that has been developed in 2020. And uh, Dr. Uh, Anura uh, Krupa, Krupad, all of you know very well from St. John's, he is the one who led it. And Dr. Bhan, M.K. Bhan, both co chaired this. Uh, um, development and I was a member secretary there and all three of us along with the big committee members. So it's not individual work but many people together like uh, Dr. Radha Krishna, then Dr. Uh, Naveen, the only statistician in the committee, then Dr. Bamji, Dr. Uh, Kamla Madam, all of us worked together and evolved this. So here we go. I mean, this, uh, right from 1940s, we just had one recommendation that is recommended dietary allowances. But in 1990, the Indian, uh, I mean, Institute of Medicine came up with four different dietary reference values, that is uh, estimated average requirements, RDAs, adequate intakes, and tolerable upper limits. And each metric has a specific use in population as well as clinical conditions. So here, this committee in 2020, why it was developed is because there were more recent data and there was nutrition transition occurring. So the committee used recent data on energy expenditure, protein metabolism. Then absorption loss data were available on vitamins and minerals. All these things were used in the development. And later statistical approaches were applied to derive the requirements through definitions of their distribution. And another important parameter that is tolerable upper limits also became very important because nowadays many people take lots of supplements along with other things. Yeah. Now this is, all of you know very well, this is the distribution. The center one estimated average requirement, though it is called average, and though it does not mean, actually mean, it is, me, it, it is supposed to be median. Actually this A, E, A, R in the center, that is adjusted for bioavailability and absorption. And on the right side you have plus 2 SD, which represents the recommended dietary allowance. So many people have this concern that while this committee recommends E, A, R for many users, I mean, there are concerns that RDA should be used because right from ages, RDA, RDA was in fashion. I mean, but wh what should be the problem? Why should we should not use? If we, uh, in normal population, if we take the dietary intake data, the requirement data and the dietary intake data should superimpose. So that way, EAR is the right metric. Another important thing is, if you take RDA as a reference, the whole distribution is going to shift to the right. I mean, if you take RDA as a reference, the RDA becomes a mean. So the population distribution shifts to the right. Then you imagine quite a significant proportion of population will be falling on the right side and they may be touching the tolerable upper limits, which is a concern. If 
health if you are taking the requirements from healthy population definitely it is superimposed and biology is never never with one single digit biology is always a distribution so right from the left to the right i feel they fall into the normal category especially when you have the data from normal population although the international committee calls 50% deficiency i don't agree with that because when you take from normal population there is always a distribution you may be requiring differently i may be requiring different that's what we heard in the morning session also so population weighted er defined for population requirements and adequacies menu planning nutrition labeling even for individuals as well as for population we recommend er and uh, as opposed to rda which is for clinical condition where you see deficiency under the uh, physician's guidance it can be taken and 95th percentile of the distribution the rda which could be used for deficiencies so here uh, i mean so here you see nutrient recommendations are specific to age gender body weight physical activity level and physiological status so you cannot go straight and take the values because it depends on your age your weight your uh, gender everything so physiological status as well therefore we need to define reference population and very quickly in one slide i'll tell you how we went on to define the reference population again because there are concerns that we have increased the weight of uh, men and also nutrient recommendations are always expressed per kg body weight or per 1000 kilocalories energy intake so it, when it is per kg it is not what is given in the book it depends on what the weight of your individual so here we have taken nnmb data 95th percentile for adults the bottom here 95 percentile uh, um, height and for that height the people who are fitting into the normal weight category the mean of that we have taken and we decided to give 55 kg for women and 65 kg for men as against 60 and 55 in the earlier committee i mean we just increase 5 kg for men and for women it re we retain the same as for children especially from 5 to 19 uh, 18 year olds uh, children and adolescents what we did is we did a sensitive analysis using uh, indian academy of pediatrics data because there's a huge data there and also we uh, took who data and we, we did the sensitive analysis we found that the calorie requirement as the age advances it is increasing it is and the difference is somewhat 160 kilocalories per day across weight i mean if you use iap it may be it may be 160 less in the uh, adolescent age if you use uh, wh it may be slightly more so so is the case with iron requirement it was slightly higher for the older age group so to err on the positive side we decided to take, take the who so we took the who cutoffs and used that as the reference value weights so here for recommendation on energy uh, energy uses these three metrics that is the basal metabolic rate the physical activity or physical activity ratio and the physical activity level based on which we define sedentary moderate activity and severe activity so what i'm trying to tell here is i mean the bmr uh, where the predict i mean um, there are several methods i won't go into the detail but we use a, a factorial method for which we need this equation by fao who unu 2004 bmr predictive equation this was shown by sores and shetty nine that the validity of shuffold equation over estimates the basal metabolic rate by about 5 to 12% it over estimates our basal metabolic rate that is the requirement of energy is over estimated so in the previous committee they decreased the bmr by 5% and the present committee 2020 decreased by another 5% therefore in all we decrease the bmr level by 10% and uh, physical activity ratio again there is data right from nin as well if you see here you see the fao who recommend i mean a physical activity level energy expenditure from the nin studies and from st john studies and the earlier rda so the physical activity level the energy that we spend for each physical activity is slightly lower for indians when you compared with western population why because we have more fat less muscle mass and less weight also so it of course it is weight specific but even for the same weight we indians spend less energy compared to the western population that's because we are less muscular more fat that could be the reason though we do not know the actual reason we spend less uh, energy for the same physical activity and therefore the physical uh, if the physical activity ratio is lower which is a metric to calculate the physical activity level naturally the uh, levels for sedentary moderate and uh, severe activity 
also heavy activity also will be lower. So what did we do here? When we compare the ICMR 89, ICMR 2010, ICMR 2020, it is almost similar except for sedentary. The sedentary 89 gave 1.6 while 2010 reduced it to 1.5 because they reduced the uh, BMR by 5% whereas the present committee reduced the BMR by 10% and now it is 1.4. I mean if you look at the FAO data also, they have a range from 1.4 to 1.6 and we took the lower range. So we are still in the correct level. So here, therefore, what happened is uh, overall change was there was decrease in energy requirements, recommendations for sedentary men and women by around 200 kilocals, 210 and 240 kilocals. And for men, not much change with moderate and heavy, but for women, there is slight change. And uh, however, for children, since there was no recent data, we uh, uh, retained the same recommendation and in fact because of weight change there is plus calories I mean more calories that are recommended in the present this thing. So here as far as protein recommendation is concerned to satisfy the currently established India, uh, indispensable amino acid requirements as recommended by FAO consultation of 2007 taking obligatory nitrogen loss of 48 that is equivalent to 0.3 grams protein per kg per day with efficiency of 47% and the median was set at 0.66 grams per kg per day and the safe protein requirement was set at 0.83 grams per kg per day. We, I do get uh, queries from exp uh, outside uh, dietitians and nutritionists because they are wondering, Madam, actually the protein requirement is the weight of the body, or weight of the individual. Here, as per your recommendation, it is 0.83. I said it is not even 0.83. 0.66 is enough to satisfy your requirement. 0.83 is the upper limit. I mean, you, you don't have to go beyond that. Even 0.66 is going to satisfy the needs, daily needs of your protein. So as against the 1 gram per kg per day 2010 RDA recommendation, this is purely because, uh, uh, I mean, we calculated it for high quality protein, whereas the earlier committee gave allowance for, uh, I mean, a low cost Indian diet where you do not get much protein from animal sources and also from milk. Therefore, they gave allowance, more allowance and recommended 1 gram per kg per day. Yeah. So therefore what happened here is, and uh, with, with respect to pregnant women, we took the total body potassium, uh, this came from St. John's and accordingly we recommended the pro protein levels for uh, pregnant women and if you see carefully in fact the protein recommendation is higher in the second trimester compared to the earlier recommendations and uh, for the third uh, trimester it is almost same as the 2010 recommendation. Actually this is based on the protein deposition during pregnancy done by total pota body potassium studies, uh, put, uh, both protein as well as fat uh, deposition. Similarly, for children also the studies were done with respect to total body potassium and the potassium was converted to nitrogen and nitrogen was converted to uh, protein and that is how we derived the recommendations for pregnant women and children. So now, I mean, all of you youngsters sitting out there, most of you, especially among men, it is a craze to take pure protein powders, especially when they go to gym. So here I want to say, as far as this recommendation is concerned, and as far as the studies that are available in literature, protein does not get utilized when there is no calories from sources like carbohydrates and fats. Look at this. So adequate non-protein energy from carbs and fat is also essential for dietary amino acids to be utilized. Scientifically, it has been shown. So nitrogen balance improves by 1 milligram per kg per day for every extra 1 kilocal kg per kg per day. So, not, I mean, just go to gym and take protein powders is not going to help. It is not going to be utilized if you don't have other sources of calories. Then reduction in energy intake by 20% resulted in negative nitrogen balance from a similar protein intake uh, individuals. So PE ratio also actually does not indicate adequacy. Why? All of us are very uh, crazy about P ratio, but does it, does it help? Does it indicate anything? Because the protein requirement is constant across different activities. It is only dependent on your weight. Therefore, since protein is constant at different levels of activity, when the energy requirement changes, because when you, when you imp increase your activity, your energy requirement goes up. Therefore, the ratio is going to change. But that, that does not indicate you are taking lower protein. So the P ratio also changes. Thus the P ratio will differ with calorie intake and for different ages. Therefore you, don't, you need not have to pay much attention. But attention must be paid to the quality of protein that goes inside. You may be taking generally even poor man's diet if you take. They take lots of protein. 
but the quality might be poor and they may not be utilized or absorbed properly. So protein quality, the cereal, I mean, this I'll come ag again later. Yeah. So coming to fats, the total fat intake should not be less than 15%. Non-essential fats, actually this is not the recommendation. It's only the upper limit. We have to remember when WHO says 30% of calories can, can come from fat, it does not mean you have to take that much, but that is the upper limit that we have to go with. So it should not exceed 30%. The intake of saturated fat also is 10%. All of you know very well. But coming to essential fats, they, it was depend based on AI for older infants on estimates taken from human milk. And for pregnant and lactating women, the development has been based on brain development data corresponding to breast milk levels of 10% of total fatty acids for linoleic and 1.5% for a linolenic acid and 0.4% for DHA. And uh, and if you carefully calculate for a 2,000 kilocal diet, the N6 fatty acid that we require actually is not at all very high. It's only about 6.6 .6 grams N6 PUFA and 3 grams. Even this 6.6 .6 and 3 grams is on a higher level. But how much are we taking? How much you must be consuming? With each diet, we must be consuming at least 30 ml or 40 ml, of, uh, especially when you go out to eat. So this is the, yeah, this is the food groups recommendation that we make. Calories from different uh, macronutrients. It should not be cereals and nutri cereals. From cereal, I mean, see, generally we talk about 30% should come from fat, 10 to 20% should come from protein, the rest can come from carbohydrates. But do you really understand if you talk like this? I mean, how do we know how much carbohydrate is contributing? So this is the food-based recommendation. So when we calculated globally, um, I mean, cereals and nutri cereals, we set it at... 45% energy can come from cereals for a good health. 45% and not less than 14% of calories should come from pulses and legumes. Less than that can be deleterious for your protein requirement and may have ill health effects. And so is the case with others like uh, another 10% uh, from vegetables and fruits together, another 10% from nuts and seeds, again this is very low, and another 10% from milk and milk products. This is how we have calculated. Yeah, actually, uh, when you look at other recommendations, it is much less than, uh, for cereals, it's much less than 45%. Uh, it is around 30%, but since we are not such great flesh eaters, it is very difficult to cover, set the requirement at 30% because we do not consume so much flesh foods. So this is the, my plate for the. So when you, con, uh, when you compare the urban data, this is a 2,000 kilocal data, my plate, where we recommend half of the plate, that is 500 grams of fruits and uh, vegetables per day, and a quarter of plate is dedicated for uh, cereals and millets, especially if you see the picture, you see it is whole grains, millets, and polished rice is very little, and another quarter is dedicated for pulses and legumes and nuts, and some allowance for fats, and some, uh, I mean, 250 to 300 ml of milk. But what you see on the right side is the urban data. What you see there is, they usually we consume, this is the data from NNMB 2016 data, and we uh, took the population that consumes roughly around 2,000 kilocals, and what we saw is very less of vegetables and fruits. It's hardly 230 something of fruits and vegetables, that is less than half of what we actually recommend. We recommend 500 grams, that is 400 grams of vegetables and 100 grams of fruits, while these, uh, the population is consuming only Two, less than 250 grams of fruits, uh, vegetables and fruits. Coming to cereals, mostly it is uh, polished white rice and very little of millets that to only 8 grams in the urban data, in the, from the urban data. And already, this is 2016 data and what we see is, here is the per capita intake of foods outside home consisting of chips, biscuits, ice creams, etc. and cakes and pastries. It is roughly around 115 grams, contributing to roughly 11% of total calories per day. So is the case with rural, but rural is worse than the urban because they are consuming much more cereals, much, much more. That is uh, around 400 grams of cereals with uh, millets, only 36 uh, grams and hardly, com I mean, uh, comparable to the plate that we recommend. So if you look, apparently if you look at the uh, protein intake in urban and rural population, don't get into the details, I'll just summarize. What, uh, what is apparent is, quantitatively if you see, their protein intake is fine. They are all taking good level of protein. Because you, if you eat tons of rice, like rice also has a lot of protein. So the, all the protein goes. But rice is deficient in, in lysine. 
Rice doesn't have much lysine, it is very low. So is the case with pulses and legumes, it has much less of uh, sulfur containing amino acids, but good amount of lysine. So a combination diet helps a lot in achieving the requirement of protein that we need. But what's happening here is, all the apparent it looks that grams wise protein is, protein is going in, but if you look at the data, even uh, for per kg body weight also, they all look normal, more than what we actually recommend in the 2020 recommendation. But if you see their habitual diets uh, PDCAS ratio, it is only 79.6. We also calculated for a vegan diet, non-vegetarian, vegetarian, I mean these are all balanced diet. Uh, on the left side corner we, you have low dairy that is only 100 ml milk and on the middle you have 200 ml milk. If with 100 or 200 ml the PDCAS is, um, I mean it is not visible here. It is not visible, the last line actually it is pretty good for uh, veg low dairy, dairy, veg dairy, non-vegetarians it's excellent, it is coming to more than 90%. Uh, for vegans it is slightly lower perhaps, I mean I do not know but even if we have right combination of cereals and legumes because of no m pro protein from milk sources the PDCAS is slightly low whereas for habitual diets it's worse than even the vegan diet because they are consuming high levels of cereals and legumes. This is again NNMB data, 360 grams of cereals versus only 30 grams of pulses and legumes and only 80 ml of milk per day. So. Total protein intake is 55.4 grams in urban and 69, 69 grams for uh, rural data. So it is mostly coming from what you observe there is cereals and millets. Nearly 50% of the protein is contributed by cereals and millets. And in central India, that is Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra, you see 60% of the protein comes from only cereals and millets. And the others, uh, other uh, foods contribute very less. And coming to pulses and legumes, it's only 14.8%. But as far as the recommendation goes, one third of your, at least one third of your protein must come from uh, pulses and legumes for good health. Whereas what we see here is only 14%. Meat and poultry is also contributing less, uh, whereas uh, it is good in south, southern region eat uh, better flesh foods, so 16.9 percent, and uh, northeast region eat better uh, quanti quality quantity of pulses, and milk intake is good in the western region, that is Gujarat, 11.4 percent is contributed, but rest of the states are very low. Intake of carbohydrates from different food groups, uh, again here I would like to emphasize the fact uh, I mean, we, uh, what I heard from uh, the keynote address is we have to in increase the protein to 20% and then that leaves 30% for uh, this one, 50%. That means carbohydrate should be only 50%. I mean, I don't know how we can achieve this ratio because 20% on regular basis consumption might, I feel, is slightly on the higher side. Uh, what we feel is on regular basis if you consume protein, 15% should be the upper limit. And carbohydrate, yes, I agree. It's very, very harmful. It increases triglycerides. It causes inflammation. It alters the body composition adversely. But then we have to take complex carbohydrates, non-starch carbohydrates. What we take is simple as well as starchy carbohydrates. Starchy carbohydrates is a problem which increases uh, insulin re resistance and also uh, derails the metabolism. So what we advise here is consumption, consumption of legumes, uh, short, I mean, the bulk of carbohydrates should contain non-starch polysaccharides with whole grains, legumes, fruits, nuts, seeds that are high in NSPs. So instead of decreasing the whole carbohydrates, uh, this is the advice that can be given. Then fat intake in urban and rural India, the total fat was 51 grams. I mean, apparently if you see total quantity is not very alarming, it is okay. It is within the recommended level, slightly higher though. But what we observe is most of the fat is coming from the visible fat, that is what you add for seasoning or what you had to gravy curries. I mean this is the average actually but the range is quite high in the population that is taking higher level of fat and quite low, I mean less than 20% in certain uh, uh, segment of population. Uh, I mean low fat, uh, fat intake also is not desirable. So if you look at the graphs there, both urban as well as rural people are consuming fat but then most of it is con coming from visible fat more so with uh, urban data than the rural data. What what uh, the recommendation is, minimum 50% of the fat should come from integrated with food. I mean, you take fatty foods like nuts and oil seeds, where you get varieties of fats. I mean, at appropriate ratios, both N6 and N3. 
I mean, and, under the different fat categories, all are non-essential. Our body has the capacity to synthesize. So it is not at all essential, except the omega-6 and the omega-3 fatty acid. And omega-6 omega and omega-3 also, we do not require at a very high level. So the oils that we take for consumption should be remembered is only for flavor and taste. But the oil, omega-6 and omega-3 are also integrated with varieties of vegetables and nuts and fruits and uh, oil seeds, which can give quite good uh, a quantity of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. And also, for people who are consuming fish, marine fish will contribute lots of long-chain PUFAs, which are again very good for health. So the, the recommendation on fat is shifting from um, extracted oils to food-based oils globally. So uh, actually what are the studies? There is a lot of misconceptions around that N6 PUFA supplementation, replacement of N6 PUFA actually will improve our cardiometabolic risk factors. So I'll just quickly show two studies, just two studies. The hazard ratio of cardi cardiometabolic mortality for each one tablespoon per day. I mean this is a very huge study done on uh, more than 5 lakh population for over a period of 16 years and more than 1 lakh population, I mean people die, uh, died and this is the data generated from that population and what they have found, found is for each 1 tablespoon per day increment, 1.08 was a risk factor for, I mean the, uh, butter increased the risk by 8% and margarine increased the risk by 6% uh, whereas the corn oil decreased it they say but it was a non-significant decrease because if you see the range there, it is 0 0.95 to 1.03. So is the case for canola oil. It is actually 0 0.94 to 1.02. Absolutely no significance at all. It is a non-significant decrease. So we don't have to get excited that it is uh, decreasing. And only for oil, olive oil, that's to a marginal decrease, we do note. And uh, introduction of uh, linoleic acid and reduced intake of vegetables derived alpha linoleic acid and fish derived uh, exonopentanoic acid and DHA actually improve. So let us see the next one. So here another study did on a, conducted on a small group of population and uh, uh, just followed for about two years. What it shows is 58% linoleic um, omega-6 fatty acid and omega-3 fatty just 0.3 percent they have taken and the group provided the LA enriched margarine had a significantly improved total cholesterol. This has repeatedly been observed in all the intervention and also uh, observational cohort studies that it improves cholesterol. Based on that we decide that it is good for health. And HDL ratio also, yes. Consistently we find that uh, LA supplementation studies improve cholesterol level and improve your HDL ratio as well. But what's happening is, the second uh, para if you see, but the number of strokes, myocardial infarctions and CVD deaths was 7 in patients given the LA enriched margarine group versus only 1 in those given the ALA enriched margarine. So, here I am not, bat not even batting for ALA. All I am trying to say is it is important to maintain the balance. It is important to control intake of this um, sunflower uh, all extracted oils to minimum, no, not to overboard it. It is not at all going to prevent because it is not medicinal. And uh, uh, there is no role for it in the preven prevention of cardiometabolism. Only compared to cholesterol or compared to uh, saturated fatty acids, it may be slightly better. That's all. So these are the foods I have listed here. Uh, Dr. Ahmed gave me this slide. Um, I mean, you see here, 0 0.1 gram alpha linoleic acid is present in this many grams of uh, wheat, pearl millet. So if you take balanced, good, wholesome diet, there are many food sources that can fulfill the needs of N3 fatty acids and more so the needs of N6. So whenever you find N3 in any food, you also come across N6 because nature has done such a wonderful job. We require more of N6 and less of N3 and it is the, the foods, wholesome healthy foods that we take, adjust the ratio in such a way, it goes very beautifully. But when you plan and take extracted oils, you go overboard on one oil and miss the balance. That's the point we have to understand. 
So nut consumption here, I would like to show again, I uh, pitch for the nut consumption instead of going for oils, go for nuts because nuts and oil seeds have right combinations of uh, this thing and many studies are there which have shown, uh, I mean, if you consume, I mean, as far as my plate for the day and as far as the recommendation that go from ICMR and I, we say at least 30 grams of nuts and oil seeds should be consumed per day or for a 2000 kilocal diet. So that way, even if you take five times a week or two times a week, it does do a lot of benefit to your health and reduces cardiometabolic risk factors. Studies are there which are shown. This is naturally available, wholesome also. So here intake, I'm just repeating the same thing. Intake of vegetables and fruits, that is the green line is the uh, average requirement. But when you see what the population that is taking, the lowest level is seen in, as far as vegetables and fruits is concerned, the northeast is consuming very low, east is better. So is the case with milk and milk products. Gujarat is doing better, but when you come to East, it is taking very less of milk and milk products. Whereas percent kilocals from processed food, you see, even in the rural regions, it's increasing, and roughly they take about four percent kilocals from uh, that is 2012 data. But now it may be significantly higher compared to the 2012 data. So urban population is consuming around 11 percent energy from uh, processed foods and four percent from rural data. Yeah, when we did the odds ratio adjusted for age, gender, BMI, total fats and energy, what we found is intake of milk and milk products decreased the risk of hypertension significantly and fruits and vegetable intake decreased the risk of diabetes, whereas processed food here increased the risk of diabetes from our NNMB data. So this we did some small analysis to show why we are not, uh, why we should not be taking high sugar foods or even the 10% sugar, the blue, uh, the um, copper sulfate blue that is there, sugar 10%. You see when you take 10% calories from sugar, you meet the calorie but then most of the micronutrients are deficient. So you can imagine if you take more sugar, you are get, uh, depriving your body more and more of nutrients. So is the case with extracted pure oils. If you take more of fats, although WHO says it should be uh, less than 15%, and the upper limit is 15. My, I mean, another 15% is given to wholesome uh, fats integrated with food. Only 15%. Even if you take that 15%, so your body is deprived of so many nutrients. That green line is the average, the actual requirement. So the animal studies that we have done, I won't be going into the details. So high carb diet, I'll tell you which level it is. Low placental and fetal uh, weight gain, uh, fetal weight was observed in our studies. Increased transcription of uh, inflammatory cytokines. Skeletal muscle glucose transporter was altered and activated insulin signaling receptor was also altered. So, uh, so I mean, high fat diet also causes inflammation, both in uh, during gestation and even in the fetal life. So here, both high fat and high carb diets affect CVD risk factors adversely, but their effects are differential. Calorie matched high carb diet, high in starch, especially starch. This study was done with starch. Contributed to increased body fat percent and fasting plasma. High carb diet and low protein diet uh, decrease low, I mean, decrease the placental and fetal weight and other uh, observations were made. And both high fat diet and HCD affected CVD risk factor adversely. HFD increased systemic inflammation and gut bacteria unfavorably, while high carb diet affected body composition and lipid profile detrimentally. But bo both were doing harm. High fat diet increased maternal body weight. This is another point. You may be giving high fat thinking that the pregnant woman is gaining weight, but it is not being translated to weights in pups. The babies are not born with high weight, whereas the mother is gaining weight if you give high fat, high fat diet. And happily, what we found was fructo-oligosaccharide when given along with a high fat diet or flax oil given along with high fat, high fat diet, it does have the ability to decrease many of the adverse effects that we see. So I'm going to conclude now. So 56.4% of the disease burden in India is diet related. So this study here shows four leading causes of diet related deaths and dallies, low intake of whole grains, low intake of fruits and vegetables, low intake of nuts and seeds, high intake of sodium. All these things are highly prevalent among our Indian population. Then leading cause for risk for NCD, high intake of sugar sweetened beverages, still not in vogue in India, but it is catching up. Then red meat, processed meat again is not our much of our problem today. Then trans fatty acid, yes, regulations are coming in place. IFSSI is working very strongly over this. And uh, lower risk of NCD with nuts and seeds, milk, seafoods, and fiber. So there is an urgent need for community drive. 
and policy efforts to discourage unhealthy dietary habits. So here, again, to summarize, excess consumption of cereal than recommended levels and high intake of starchy foods, far lesser consumption of uh, legumes, milk, nuts, we see, and increasing ingestion of extracted vegetables, seed oils, and ultra-processed HFF foods is also happening in India. Abdominal obesity, even in 2016, it was 53% abdominal obesity. I always talk of abdominal obesity rather than overall obesity because many people overall, they may appear very trim and all, but if you measure the circumference, it's much higher. So 53% among urban and 18.8% .8 among rural population, and it is one of the high, good, uh, high risk factor for cardiometabolic diseases. Then increased risk of diabetes uh, with lower consumption of vegetables and fruits that we have shown. So what we recommend here is empowerment of rural women in best practices, home gardens, training for clean and healthy recipes in both low and high income settings may potentially improve positive choices for healthy diets. Policy support for formulation of healthy foods and making them available in affordable costs is a very, very big thing that we have to do. Then regulations such as food taxes, food labeling, food marketing will also help reduce consumption of unhealthy foods. So I'm happy to say here that, uh, I mean, uh, we were, NIN has been doing uh, surveys on a regular basis, both in urban, rural, and tribal regions, right from 1970s through National Nutrition Monitoring Bureau, and it was stopped in 2016. And uh, the earlier DG, Dr. Balram Bhargava, approved this proposal once again, though the name is different, it is essentially same, that is uh, diet and biomarker study. But apart from the survey that uh, regularly been done under NNMB, uh, the 24-hour diet recall that we do, here, the I mean, we will be doing in all all states. So we'll get state level dietary intake data on 24 hour diet using the 24 hour dietary call. And the good thing is, I mean, we'll be also collecting blood bio, um, blood uh, for bio, bio, nutrition biomarkers and also health biomarkers. So, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, it will be a good data to connect dietary intake and also blood levels. And another important thing is it is a paperless uh, uh, real-time data collection and quality checks are at various levels, about four to five quality checks are there, external, internal, everything. I mean, very strongly built protocol. Uh, I mean, across all age groups, across the whole country. And another important thing is, I mean, venous blood, there has been uh, criticism that uh, venous blood is uh, from NFHS5, does a lot of work. I mean, uh, the National Family Health Service, uh, right from up to five, the last one which was released. However, however they collect uh, capillary blood because their sample size is very huge. And capillary blood means it might overestimate anemia, underestimate hemoglobin level. Therefore, the experts are suggesting it will be good to collect venous blood. So here, for the first time, we'll be collecting venous blood across India in all the states so that we'll get correct estimate of hemoglobin value and therefore right prevalence of anemia among the population. Apart from that, we are also using the auto-analyzer, very well validated with the uh, beckman Calter in our lab. Validation reports are there, studies have been published. So we are not going to use HemoQ, but we are going to use auto-analyzer. So this is a good thing. The ICMR, the earlier DG approved it, and the current DG has uh, endorsed it and almost going to release the money. It went to the ministry level, DHR, the Department of Health Research, and from there it went to ministry. They did strict, uh, strict checks and all, and after that it got approved, and now we're almost going to receive the money, 100 crores project. So this will be done on a regular basis, once in every five years. So in conclusion, I would like to tell, in ICMR N9, here many committee members are also there. We are going to release this dietary guidelines for Indians. So just we heard, I mean, uh, whether clinician, dietitians are required or not, I truly endorse. Yes, even if there is a book which is very easily, I mean, we make it so easy that common man can understand what they require, what they are supposed to do, but nevertheless, a human touch, human emotion, and human interaction is extremely important. So these di the dietary guidelines with 16 goals in it, and uh, we added two or three more uh, recommendations here. It's going to come out very soon. The final version is ready, actually. And very soon, we'll go, we are going to put it, uh, put it up on the website for the expert view from all of you. All of you must actively participate and give your opinions and suggestions. We'll give enough time, one month, two months' time. After that, it will be finalized, and it will be uh, released. Then uh, this is the one which Madam was saying, uh, the recommendation for food allergy. I mean, uh, it's true, I mean, we are recommending, but then functional indices of optimal health is very important and with different environmental challenges. When there is uh, environmental stress, our requirements also go up. Keeping, in, keeping that in mind, our recommendations also will change. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, your uh, insightful and thought-provoking lecture. Thank you. We'll
we'll move on to the next session so i hand over the mic to my colleague dr nandeep to uh, coordinate this session on uh, title industrial session